So today, what we're going to do is answer that question, how can I know that I am saved? Big question, isn't it? How can I know that I am saved? Well, that brings up another question. And the next question is this, what is salvation? I think if we know what salvation is, then we can ask, we can answer the previous question, how can I know that I am saved? Certainly this was a question that weighed heavily on my mind during my teenage years. I prayed to receive Christ at a church youth camp in between uh, my sixth grade year and my seventh grade year. We were given kind of the essence of Christ's ministry through drama at that particular camp. And the very last night, the crucifixion was portrayed to us. And I knew in the depths of my heart that I needed Jesus. There wasn't a question about that. And so I prayed to receive Christ Jesus. Now, I didn't really know what that meant. I just knew that I had a need for him. And so I prayed. It was an emotional moment, an emotional time in my life. But I was still fairly young, 12 or 13 years of age. And then junior high hit and high school hit and all the temptations that those atmospheres bring and I wasn't a very good Christian man I succumbed to a lot of the temptations that came my way and so I wondered am I truly saved did what I do back at that camp in Covington Georgia really take did something really happen there I wasn't sure So what do you do when you're not sure? Well, I'm going to pray again. And so just about every time I sinned, I would pray again, Lord, come into my heart. Maybe it'll take this time. Well, and then the next weekend would happen, and, you know, Sunday night I'm praying again. And then praying again, it became a ritual. Lord Jesus, I've blown it. I'm not sure I'm a Christian. I'm not sure I'm saved. So I'm going to pray one more time for you to come in and take up residence in my heart. But I didn't have that assurance. And so I probably prayed five, six hundred times to receive Christ. Now, have any of y'all done that? Why do we do that? Because that question, how can I know that I am saved, hasn't been answered. And for me, the reason it wasn't answered is because I didn't know what salvation was. I didn't know what this gospel message was all about and what takes place in the life of a believer the moment faith is exercised. Now, in Romans 5.10, Paul gives a concise statement concerning salvation. If you want to know what salvation is, this is the verse, Romans 5.10. For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? That's salvation. We were enemies of God sinners by name and when we were in that state God did something for us he sent Jesus to die on the cross and through that death he reconciled you to God that barrier of sin that stood between you and a relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son had been removed once and for all reconciliation had taken place that happened when you were an enemy God's reconciled the entire world unto himself and then he says how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life Salvation is much more than forgiveness of sins. Salvation is much more than what Christ accomplished for us 
through his death on the cross. The gospel message is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He died to take away our sins once and for all so that he could raise us from the dead spiritually so that we could walk in the newness of life. We were reconciled when we were enemies through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? So salvation is a death to life issue. Now, salvation is being saved from the consequence of sin. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what's the wages of sin? Death. That's God's punishment for sin. It's not being in and out of fellowship with God. It's not being taken out to the woodshed to have a little paddling. It's not uh, in school suspension. It's not a timeout chair. The wages of sin is death. And that is true for every sin. We like to rank them. You know, we've got little sins and we've got big sins. Well, guess what? From God's vantage point, little sins get death and big sins get death. The wages of sin is death. And so salvation is being saved from that consequence. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and that was Adam, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. So God told Adam not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He decided to do that. And God had said, on the day that you do, you will surely die. So Adam's sin, the consequence of that sin was death, and death spread to all men. So when you and I come into this world, we come into this world dead spiritually. We're alive bodily, we're alive soulishly, but these spirits of ours are dead. We are separated from the life of God. In Ephesians 2, 1, Paul writes this, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. So what was your condition before you came to know Christ? Dead. Dead spiritually. That's why we're on this lifelong search until we find Jesus. We're trying to fill that void that is in our lives. We're trying to fill that emptiness that is inside. But it can't be filled until we come to Jesus by faith. Because what's missing is the very life of Christ. Romans 7, Paul wrote this, I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. Paul thought that eternal life was was going to come through obedience to the Ten Commandments. And the Jewish law. So he did everything he could in his power to live up to those righteous requirements. And finally, when he looked himself in the mirror and got honest with himself, he realized that as good as he tried to be, he had failed miserably. And the wages of sin became his. So he thought those commandments were to bring him life, but actually, when he looked himself in the mirror, he found out that he was dead, dead spiritually. He realized his true condition. Now, whoever believes in him, Jesus is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. We're born into this world. We're born into this world spiritually dead. We're under the condemnation of God. That's our status. 
That's our position in this world. Now something has to change before our physical death occurs for our status to change. We're dead, we need life. We're under condemnation when we believe in Christ. We are no longer condemned. So God is offering this gospel message so a change can take place inside of you. So that you can go from death to life. That's what needs to take place. And indeed, that's what happens at the moment of salvation. But for now, man's condition, we're spiritually dead. Kind of dark, isn't it? Seems final. Not a lot of hope in that reality. Until you realize what Christ came to accomplish. So what's God's solution? And we're going to look at this based on how Paul wrote in Romans 5, 10. While we were yet enemies, he reconciled us through the death of Christ. So we're going to look at what Christ accomplished for us through his death. And then part two of this will be looking at what he accomplished for us through his resurrection. In Colossians chapter 1. God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him, in Jesus. And through him to reconcile to himself all things. Whether things on earth or things in heaven. By making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So Jesus' death on the cross makes peace. It reconciles not just children of God but all things unto himself. Now once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. We have evil behavior in our daily lives, don't we? We have bad thoughts. We have bad attitudes. We have bad actions. That's what we were as lost people. Even as children of God, those things can still race through our minds, can't they? But as lost people, those evil thoughts, those evil attitudes, those evil behaviors, we would look at them and we would say, wow, we can't get near God. Because if we do, we know he's just going to slam the hammer of punishment right down on top of us. So we were alienated. Those evil behaviors, those evil attitudes alienated us from God. We felt like this guy. That God was just sick at his stomach at every thought of us. Drinking his heavenly Pepto-Bismol, trying to calm his stomach every time he thought about you and looked at your evil behavior. And we think that, don't we? And the reason we think that is because we haven't yet understood what the cross is all about. But now, he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Jesus' death on the cross reconciled us. That is taking supposed enemies and bringing them together as friends. Now, God was never our enemy. He always loved us. And this plan of his to bring us back unto himself has always been in his mind. was executed 2,000 years ago through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ Jesus. But in his mind, he was always going to reach out to you and me in love and in mercy and in forgiveness. We were the problems. Because of our lifestyles, we looked at ourselves as enemies of God. But through his death, he's reconciled us. He's brought us together so that we could be friends. And in this reconciliation, 
God, Jesus Christ does something for us that we could never do for ourselves. He presents us to God the Father as holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. Is that amazing or what? To think and to know and to have confidence in the fact that you stand before God holy, without blemish, and free from accusation. It's not because of what you've done. It's because of the work of Christ on the cross. Paul carries on with this theme in 2 Corinthians. He says, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So he reconciled us unto himself, and then he has imparted to us this very ministry of reconciliation so that we can go out and let people know the good news. And here is this good news, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. So is Jesus, or God the Father, counting your sins against you? No. Why? Because of the work of, of Christ on the cross. And that's the privilege that we have. It doesn't matter what somebody is engaged in. It doesn't matter what their sinful behavior is. There are plenty of options, right? But to each and every one of those, we can say to the person who is engaged in them, God is not counting that sin against you. That's the ministry of reconciliation. And we can say that with full confidence and full authority because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. God is not counting your sins against you. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 12, I love this passage. And if you mark your Bibles, underline this, this verse. I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. If you're a child of God, you have come to Christ by faith, you have received this forgiveness that he provided for you 2,000 years ago. And as a result of that, you can say, my sins have been forgiven. Now, is that just some of them? No, it is all of them. All of your sins, start to finish, have been forgiven. Jesus shed his blood on the cross. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. He shed it once and for all. And when you come to him by faith, you receive that forgiveness. And you stand before him as a forgiven person. Do you believe that? It's true. You are a forgiven person. Now this death on the cross... It happened at a point in time. It was a historical event. Historians have looked at it, have examined all the writings about it, and they have concluded that indeed Jesus lived in Nazareth. He had his ministry there in Capernaum at the Sea of Galilee, that he went to Jerusalem on a number of occasions and that he was crucified on a Roman cross in around 32, 33 A.D. They know that to be historical evidence, to be true. It happened at a point in time, but it has eternal consequence. From that point, it went backwards and it went forwards throughout eternity. All sin for all time has been taken care of once and for all. So he dealt eternally with the cause of death. And then he rested eternally 
from his work of reconciliation. His victory cry on the cross. His very last words before he handed his spirit over to God the Father were these. It is finished. And those words are resounding today in the hearts of believers all over the world. And will continue to capture hearts for as long as we're here on this earth. It is is finished he sat down at the right hand of God the Father that's what Hebrews 10 12 says but when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins he sat down at the right hand of God so the thing that killed us sin has been dealt with once and for all there's nothing more for God to do He condemned sin and sinful man. Jesus Christ stood in our place as a sacrifice. He bled. He died. He offered up his spirit to God the Father. God the Father said, I am satisfied. Jesus said, it is finished. It is done. As a result of it, you are a forgiven person. But as we talked about, that's not the entirety of of the story he had to deal with sin once and for all so that he could carry out his real purpose for you and me and that's to restore life to the dead you and I were dead that was our condition Jesus Christ had to deal with the cause of death sin he did that once and for all and now through his resurrection he can provide to you and me life And so what is salvation? It is being saved by his resurrected life. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then he asked the question, do you believe this? Lazarus had been dead for four days. Martha and Mary had sent an urgent message to Jesus to come quickly. Her brother was sick. He was dying. He was on his deathbed. They had seen Jesus perform miracle after miracle after miracle. And they were hoping for the same. And they sent this message out full of anticipation and hope. Their world was light and bright and they just knew Jesus was going to be there as quickly as he could. Jesus gets the message, and he decides to do his own thing for a couple of days. We're not going yet. I know he's sick. I know he needs me, but I still have things to do over here. And so he tarried for a couple of days and and then decided, okay, it's time to go, gathered up his disciples, and they journeyed to Bethany. Well, by the time he got there, Lazarus had been dead. They had put him in the tomb, and four days had passed. That's significant because on day four, decay starts to set into the human body. And it smells, and it's just yuck. And Jesus comes on the scene, and he says, now it's time for me to do something. Martha and Mary were kind of ticked. Why didn't you come? If you had just been here, Jesus, this would have never happened. Why weren't you here? I mean, you said you loved us. You said you loved Lazarus. Why did you treat us this way? And Jesus had something else in mind. And that's why he said this, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Why did Jesus come? So that you and I could have life. And right here in this miracle, one of the last that he performed before his death, burial, and resurrection, he raised Lazarus from the dead. Why? So that we can see that that's what he wants to do for us. We're like Lazarus. 
We're dead spiritually. We're wrapped in the grave clothes of the law under that condemnation. And Jesus wants to set us free with new life. And just as he called Lazarus from the grave, he calls you and me from our spiritual graves. And he says, come out so that you can have life everlasting. Do you believe this? Because that's what salvation is. In Ephesians 2, we just read a few minutes ago that we were dead in sins. And here in verses 4 and 5, we see because of his great love for us, because of God's great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. That's the message. You were dead. You needed life. Because of God's great love for you and his mercy, he did for you what you could not do for yourself. He raised you from the dead. That is the grace of God. It is God's act to bring life to the dead spiritually. That's what grace is. We didn't deserve that. We didn't earn that. There was nothing that we could do to cause God to do that, he was compelled by his love for us. And he reached down to those of us who are dead spiritually and raised us to life, making us alive together with Christ. Just as Jesus was raised from the dead physically, you and I are raised from the dead spiritually. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. So we hear the word. We hear the message concerning Christ Jesus. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. And we believe that message. Our hearts respond with faith in what Christ has accomplished. And we believe him. We believe in him, we trust in him, we put our full weight of trust on the Lord Jesus. And when we do, eternal life becomes ours. And we will never be condemned. Were we condemned? Yes, we were under the condemnation of God. Through faith in Jesus, we are brought out from underneath that condemnation and placed into Jesus where there is no condemnation at all. And here's what John writes. When that happens, we have crossed over from death to life. What happened to you at the moment of salvation? You went from being a dead person spiritually to being one fully alive in Jesus Christ. Like these diagrams, we were on one side of this chasm, spiritual death under the bondage of the law of sin and death, and spiritual life is on the other side. Spiritual life is in God. It can't be found in this world. Sometimes we get married hoping to find that spiritual life that we're looking for. And we rely on our mates to do something for us that they can't do. They're just not capable of providing spiritual life. They don't have it in them to give it. Sometimes that's why marriages go amok. That's why they go the wrong path. Why? Because we're looking to each other to do something that only God can do. God's the source of spiritual life. God is the source of life everlasting. And it comes from above. You can't find it in this world. That's why... People move from one thing to the next and to the next and to the next. Why? Because they get money and they realize money isn't the answer. They get power and they realize power isn't the answer. They get status and they realize status isn't the answer. They have relationships and they figure out relationships aren't the answer. And finally, you've exhausted everything the world has for you and you just sit there and say, what's left? What's left? 
until somebody comes and brings the message and says, Jesus is left. And all that you're looking for is found in him. And Jesus bridges this gap between us and the life of God. And when we understand that gospel message, when we believe that word concerning him, we cross over. Leaving the law of sin and death behind, we cross over and embrace this life everlasting. So what is salvation? Salvation is restoring man to his true humanity. God created Adam and Eve fully alive. They had a relationship with God the Father. There was nothing that stood between them and God until the moment that they sinned. And at that moment, death entered their lives, death entered the world, and impacted all of us. Through this gospel message, God restores that life in each and every one of us. His intention was for us to be fully alive in Jesus. Now in John 3, he says, I reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. That's what happens at new birth. We're born again of the Spirit. Our human spirits were dead. When we come to him by faith, those spirits are regenerated. And then Jesus sends his Holy Spirit to take up residence in our lives. At that moment, we're fully alive. We're exactly what God intends us to be. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We can't live the Christian life on our own. It's an impossibility to try to walk that path through human effort. It can't happen. Jesus had to come and take up residence in us so that we could have hope of experiencing what God desired for us. So Jesus Christ in us is our hope of glory. Christ in the man, just as God intended it from the very beginning. That's salvation. Jesus took away our sins at the cross. He was raised so that he could make us alive together with him. And then he comes to live inside of us. Transaction complete. That's why Paul says you're a new creature in Christ. Now in him you have eternal life. Here's God's testimony. God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. It is a great passage in the book of Hebrews. I think the most comforting words that we could ever read as we go through the pages of the New Testament. We come to this point and the writer of Hebrews makes a declaration it's a statement of fact. God says he will never leave us nor forsake us. Do you believe that? Well, what if I'm sinning? Well, he just said he would never leave you nor forsake you. So when you're sinning, guess who's there with you? Jesus, and he's the light of this world. He is the light of life. And when we're in Jesus and Jesus is in us and we choose to sin, his light shines right down on it, exposes it for what it is, and we look at it and go, yuck, I don't want to be involved in that. I don't want to be involved in something that's going to bring harm or pain or injury to a loved one. And the only way I'm going to know that is having the light of Jesus shine brightly on it. And it does because he's never going to leave us nor forsake us. And guess what he's going to say to us at that very moment? You see that act? I took it away once and for all at the cross. I stood in your place. I took the punishment. I died so that you could have life everlasting. You are a forgiven person. 
It's like, wow, Lord, thank you. Thank you that you have promised that you will never leave me nor forsake me and that you can give me a deeper understanding of truth of how much I need you, how much I need to walk in dependence upon who you are in my day-to-day life. For apart from you, I can do nothing. If I'm trying to go it on my own, this yucky sin is what I produce. And thank you that you show me for show it to me for what it truly is so that I can get my eyes refocused on you. And thank you that there is no condemnation for that sin because of what you accomplished for me 2,000 years ago. And thank you that you're here with me forever and that you will never leave me nor forsake me. You're not a God in heaven who, when I sin, turns his back on me. That's not who you are. You're right there with me. We think, and I used to think this, every time I sinned, there was a little black mark next to my name. And I had to do everything that I could possibly do to get that black mark erased. And pretty soon, by my name, you couldn't distinguish the check marks. It was just one black line. But that's not how God operates. The check marks are gone. He remembers our sins no more. That's an eternal act. And it's true every moment of every day. And God says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. That that work on the cross ensures that that promise is true. 1 John 5, and this is the testimony. The Word of God, the Bible, is God's testimony concerning Jesus. And here at the end of the New Testament, we get a conclusion. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. What was God's desire for you? To have eternal life. And we're not talking just about heaven when you die. We're talking about something that happens now. You have an opportunity to know Jesus now, to know God the Father now. That's what life everlasting is. And so God has given us eternal life. He has brought us to this point where we can have a relationship with him, where we can grow in his love and his grace and his mercy, and our hearts can align with his in this world that we live in. And this life is in his son. Where is life to be found? In Jesus. There's no other source for life everlasting. There's many other religions. There's many other philosophies. But that's all they are. Religions and philosophies. They don't have life. They don't have it in them to give us. Life is found in one place and one place alone, in Jesus. And he who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So if you have Jesus, what do you have? Life. If you don't have Jesus, do you have life? No. And I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So why did he write that? So that we could know, not hope for, not pray that, you know, maybe when we die, everything's going to balance out and I'll get life everlasting. Not so that we can walk through life being a 95-5 guy. He wrote this so that we could be 100% sure that we are saved. So that you may know that you have eternal life. Jesus took away your sins once and for all. They're not an issue anymore as far as God is concerned. You are a forgiven person. And as a result of that, through his resurrection, he's made you an alive person. Just as Jesus was raised from the dead... You have been raised from the dead spiritually. You have life everlasting. 
So why is this true? We're going to ask a couple of questions. What caused Adam's death? Sin. What's the wages of sin is death. So Adam sinned. He died. He brought death to the entire world. Now, do your sins carry the same penalty? Yes. Who took the penalty of your sins for you? Jesus did. Is Jesus going to die again for you? No. He did it once and he did it for all. Did his death on the cross take away your sins once and for all? Because of the cross, will the Spirit of God ever depart from you when you sin? No. That would be death, wouldn't it? The wages of sin certainly is death, but who took your punishment for you? Jesus did. And if he took your punishment for you, there's none left for you. Now, you could not have eternal life until the cause of death was dealt with eternally. Therefore, because of the finality of the cross, you are complete in him. You have been given fullness or completeness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. You're complete. Nothing more to add to you. Jesus has done it all, and because you are in him, you are complete. Now, can you add to that? No. His divine power has given us everything that we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. So, how much has he given us? Everything. So are you lacking anything as far as this life of godliness is concerned? No, you have it all. His divine power has given us everything. Now in him we have redemption through his blood. That's freedom. That's freedom. We were bound to the law of sin and death. We were prisoners of sin. But through the blood of Jesus, we have been set free. We have been redeemed from that old way of life so that we could walk in the newness of life. That's what we have in Christ. And what else we have in Christ is forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. We have forgiveness of sins so that we can live in this freedom that has been given to us in Christ Jesus. So if you're in him, you have redemption and you have the forgiveness of sins. Will you ever need more forgiveness? No, you have it all. So what's the conclusion to all this? When Jesus saves, he saves completely. He didn't offer a partial salvation He didn't offer a temporary reprieve. He saved us completely. Because Jesus lives forever in Hebrews 7. He has a permanent priesthood. Jesus died. That body of Jesus was put into a grave. And then he was raised three days later. And he has taken up his rightful place at the right hand of God the Father in the heavenlies. He lives forever. And because he lives forever, his priesthood endures forever. And therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Jesus has saved you completely. If you're unsure, if you're a 95-5 person and that 5% of doubt is weighing heavy on your heart, on your mind, it's keeping you up at night, it's causing you to toss and turn, it's causing you to wonder, and you're not seeing victory in your life, guess what? It's time to drive a stake. It's time for you to get anchored to the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's time for you to rest fully in what he has accomplished for you, once and for all.